Okay, so welcome uh, to our Bible study on uh, 2 Samuel. Uh, we are in chapter 5 last time. Uh, you have, will recall that we began in chapter 5 and got as far as verse 5 uh, the coronation of David and then the, the very brief summary of his reign simply as a series of his. Um, of his years of reign. That's what we got to last time, and this time we will uh, continue uh, with the rest of chapter five. And uh, I will talk about a little bit about how that fits into the wider narrative coming chapters uh, in a moment. But for now, let's open with prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your guidance of your people through history, for raising up uh, righteous men and women to serve as examples of faith and of obedience. So we pray that as we study, you're working through the kingdom of David, that you would uh, teach us to imitate him in his faith and in his faithfulness, to learn from his mistakes and errors. And together with him and all your saints, always to seek our hope and our confidence in the life that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, so uh, this handout uh, that I just gave to you, the chronology of uh, David's reign. And, um, uh, put it on the screen as well. Anybody who's watching online, should they be anybody watching online can also see. moment. So this, this particular uh, document here, Chronology of David's Reign, is, a, is, is not my own work at all. I took it from a commentary uh, on uh, a commentary on um, 2 Samuel uh, by an American Lutheran uh, scholar of the Old Testament, Andrew Steinman, and he, uh, using all kinds of reference points, um, has um, uh, so tried to put together the the exact order in which things actually uh, took place uh, in, in David's reign. And um, not only that, but also when exactly they were. And we don't really need to, um, uh, we don't really need to kind of go to, through his working uh, as such, uh, just to trust. And this, this may not be 100% accurate because the data points are sometimes quite vague, uh, but uh, the, uh, the general point stands that uh, th this is roughly in which the uh, order of events is. Now, if you look at the dates, they start, those, that first word Nisan is just one of the Hebrew months uh, in the beginning of the year, in the spring. Uh, but if you look at that, those dates, obviously the dates run chronologically, otherwise it wouldn't be very helpful. Beginning in 1009 BC and running all the 969 uh, BC, the 40 years of David's reign. If you look at the Bible references on the right, uh, you will notice uh, that they, that's not entirely uh, sequential. So we go going to Samuel 2, 2 Samuel 2, 2 Samuel 2, 2 Samuel 3, and 4, 5, so it runs like that for a bit. 2 Samuel 5, next one is 2 Samuel 10 and 11 and 12. Mm. Then 10, 2 Samuel 10 and 11, 11 and 12, 12, 13, 13, 14, back to 5, 14, 7, 6, 7. You see that mm. the things jump around. And the reason they jump around is not because the writer is incompetent, but because he's not just giving us a, a chronology of David's reign. He is teaching us uh, something about, uh, you see, he, he's sort of organizing material, if you like, around certain themes. I mean, this, I remember years ago reading a history of the British Navy uh, and uh, very interesting book. And it every era it covered, it would cover an era, 
and he would write the, if you like, the military history of that, all the battles. Oh. And you got to the end of the battles, and he go right back to the beginning, and now he would talk about all the administration of the Navy in that era. And then he, once he finished that, he'd go back to the beginning again and talk about all the, uh, all, uh, I can't remember exactly what it is, but in the, you know, the, oh, I've forgotten that, but that's basically for each area, he would take three different areas of interest in Navy. You, you get to read the first one, this is really fascinating, and you want to read the next bit, and it takes you back to an uh, naval administration. Well, that's something very interesting, actually was. You read this and then, but, you know, you, you're constantly going backwards and forwards, and then you move forward, backwards and forwards. That was his, his particular mm. approach. And likewise, you also have to Samuel, and just to re remind you that we don't know who that is. Likewise, there are certain things, there's a lot of it is chronological, but he groups things together sometimes that are not in a chronological order, but in a thematic order, these sort of, mm. sorts of things. And particularly, we'll see this in, uh, at the beginning in chapter five, uh, which you will see in your chronology, is uh, takes us in, we're talking about mid-1002, it says 2 Samuel 5. And then if you look halfway down, it says 979 to 976, David goes as far as 2 Samuel 5 mm -hmm. as well. And I'll explain why that is once, once we get to the end. Of it. So just be aware that when you're reading this, otherwise, if you're not aware of this, the text doesn't make sense if you're reading carefully. Uh, because because it's not chronological in order, okay. But almost everything in chapter five is early on. Not not absolutely everything, but almost all. If they don't know who wrote this, how do they know it's correct? Because our our confidence in the Bible is not based on that we know who wrote it and and, and we know the brick. Because if we know that it was written by a man called I don't know Joash of Jerusalem, how would that help us? What do you mm -hmm. know about Joash of Jerusalem? You wouldn't know. We wouldn't know anything about it except that he wrote this. So that doesn't that doesn't make uh, any difference. Uh, the very short argument is that we trust it because it's in the Bible. We trust it because yeah. it's God's word. Now, of course, that in a sense that just pushes the question why we saw how do we know that just because it's in the Bible we know it's actually trustworthy because it was actually put together. Um, well, it was written in its time mm. at a time when there were lots of different sources for these things. So you know, there are all kinds of references within the books of Samuel and Kings to other books which no longer exist. They don't haven't survived, mm -hmm. but they're also doing it. And the rest of the history, especially in the book of books of Kings, you know, the rest of the history of King whoever and uh, what it, it is written in the book of the histories of the book or something. There are there are all these other books that no longer exist, mm -hmm. so we can cross reference. Go all the reference to you know he built such and such and he's still there to this day. Well, he's not there today. But he was at the time of the writing, so there are all sorts of verifiable, uh, verifiable facts. If you want to think of it purely in in human terms, I guess uh, the things that people either forget or don't want us to know is worse than us uh, not knowing. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that could be a cynical way of looking at it. I they're hiding all the bad bits. Uh, Anybody who writes the history of anything has to make selections. If, if, I, if I come and come to your house at six o'clock in the evening, I said, how was your day? And you tell me absolutely everything. I don't think I'll ever ask you that question again <laughs> after that, because I'll be there till midnight. You know, that too. And then Just after, midnight? After, after I finished my toast, mm. I then had an apple. You know, you have to, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. select sort of things, yeah, yeah. you know, and I've, I've had conversations like this. Now, how was your day? Well, I got to work oh. and there were four envelopes on the mat. So I opened them. One of us from four, such and such. Oh. Yes, and the Just, how was your day? Was it good or was it bad? You know, and said, <laughs> did anything of interest to me? Or of significance to you happen mm -hmm. that you know we make selections yeah it is it is whoever's it's, doing it that it's what they want us to know exactly mm -hmm. yeah i guess everybody there is no such thing as purely neutral writing mm -hmm. every you know <laughs> history is storytelling mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's made up there are true stories and there are false stories but it is storytelling. Mm -hmm. you're telling a story the Gospels are all telling a story. They tell us about Jesus, but they don't just narrate what Jesus did. They have an agenda. They have a, they have a theme. They tell, they tell certain things in a certain way so that we pick up certain points. That's not dishonest. 
at all. There's nothing sinister or dishonest about it. It's just how you tell a thing. Otherwise, you know, it's, 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 well, it's not, I was going to say that, you know, otherwise you're just presenting bland, presenting bland facts. Actually, it's impossible to present bland facts when you're always mm -hmm. selecting. And how you select matters. And if you don't think about it, you end up with something that's incoherent and doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And you should be, let someone else to do the job. But if once you begin to select, you have to have a reason. So why am I saying this and not that? Um, After Jesus, there was lots of people that are able to give their uh, way to and he said that you know that he had different stories but mm. we have them all but well we have all the ones that we need yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean john says at the end of his gospel that everything was written down in the books of the world world wouldn't be sufficient um also when it comes to books of the old testament our short cut to accepting them is that jesus accepted them and if mm. we trust jesus then we trust the bible um, that's you know the, the, uh, that question could be answered at the you know by writing a long book, mm -hmm. but that's the shortcut. We, mm -hmm. Jesus took this as God's word. We take it as God's word because we trust Jesus. So that's the chronology hit there. So you might you know you may want to just keep it in your Bible somewhere so that when you are reading, it's it's quite handy to see where we are in the story at any uh, given point. Because it's hard to keep these things, you know, when you're reading these things and they're not, they're not using, they don't say, you know, 3rd of March or two years later or whatever. It's, mm. it's hard to keep track of it and it helps when somebody else has done homework for us. So let's now go into the actual text. So we're in chapter 5, verse 6, roughly in the year 1002. David has just been made uh, king or has recently been made king of all Israel, and this, and remember, he is, uh, he has been based in Hebron, which is in Judah, uh, a little bit north, no, southeast of Jerusalem, but in the Judean highlands. Um, and now we hear of how Jerusalem comes to be part of the kingdom and becomes prominent. So from verse uh, six, please, uh, if you could, somebody could read from, uh, verse 6 uh, to verse uh, 10. I'm dizzy, so I can't. That's all right. I didn't ask who can't. Just if you... <laughs> yeah. I'll do it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not hearing my own voice very well today, but... As long as we hear. Yes, yeah, that's fine. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, you will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off thinking, David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David, and David said on that day, whoever would smite the Jebusites, let him get up and water, water shaft to attack the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul. Therefore it is said, the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. And David dwelt in the stronghold, and called it the city of David. And David built the city round about from the Milo inward. And David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts was with him. Did Thanks. you say to that? Audience? That's it, yeah, thank you very much. Um, okay, so here is the, this is the uh, conquest of uh, Jerusalem. Now at this time, Jerusalem is a very small place. Oh. Very, very small place, it's just a, it's a, it's, a, it's a walled city, but it's, that city really just is a very small village. It will make Titchfield look quite big. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's a small place. We know because we know the geography of that area and the archaeological evidence of the, this bit, part of the city. The part, this part of Jerusalem, which is the original part, the Jebusite uh, part, is really very, very limited in scope because David already begins to extend it. Solomon expands it uh, considerably. It, for example, the Temple Mount, which uh, is Mount Moriah, by the way, which is the same mountain where Abraham nearly sacrificed Isaac, saying oh. this is where it is, um, is, is to the one side of Jerusalem. Now, if you think of, uh, it, you know, the, thing, the reason why this is a brilliant place to build a fortified town is because it's got valleys on three sides and a mountain top on one side. 
So it's very easy to defend a good defensive position. Um, so trust David then to say, well, I can take that. And the Jebusites, first of all, do you know anything about the Jebusites? Have you heard the term before? Yes, but I can't remember. It's on the list of when, when Israel is about to conquer the promised land. It's on the list of the all the nations, oh, the Canaanites, yeah. the Jebusites, the Gigashites, yeah. the Hittites, the, uh, and so on. Um, and it's one of those. So it's one of the peoples uh, that lived uh, in the promised land. And the as we know, the, the Israelites were, were not successful in conquering the entire land. And in the book of Joshua, it's presented to us as a, as a sign of the, God's dis, dis pleasure with the people of Israel in the, you know, so they say, because you have been such and such, uh, you will not get the whole inheritance. And now it becomes, that's one reason why the presence of the Philistines is, if like it's a spiritual problem uh, for Israel, because what it does uh, is it uh, demonstrates to, you know, it's like, it demonstrates to the Israelites all the time that the whole land is not under our control. In fact, we are being controlled within the land by somebody else. Which is why also then the task that Saul is given by God and then David picks up of defeating the Philistines is of such importance. It's a little bit like, well, it's, it's, it's significant like the presence of the Roman Empire in the time of Jesus. They, their very presence there is a reminder that things aren't as they ought to be. And the question wasn't, is this good or is this bad, but what should be done about it? And different, like the different parties that we hear about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and some of the others that we learn about from outside the Bible, uh, the Essenes and, the, um, uh, and, and some of the other groups. One of the things that different, uh, separated them was that they had different ideas of what should be done about the presence of the Romans. So the Sadducees said, well, it is what it is, and we should make the most of it, and grew fabulously rich as a result. The Pharisees said, this is a spiritual problem, so the answer is that we need to uh, purify ourselves spiritually, and that's hence their, their kind of strict observance of the law. The Essenes said, this is a sign that God, God has moved his, his favour from the temple in Jerusalem, and they withdrew to a desert, into a monastery. It, you know, and then, then you later on, uh, later in time, you've got the Zealots who said they must be kicked out, and started to say, and, and Started the terror campaign and then the war. Okay. These are all, they are all different responses to the fact they said the Romans are here. And the fact that the Romans are here means that the kingdom of David has not been, is not here, and therefore there's more to come. And we, and part of that more to come is that the enemy will be defeated. How should we go about it? Do we accommodate ourselves and wait? Do we cl clarify, uh, you know, cleanse ourselves and wait for God to act? Do we say the hope's, you know, the hope is somewhere else and go to the desert, or do we fight? And they all responded to the same problem. Likewise, in the time of David and throughout this early, you know, this part of Israel's history, we are in the promised land, but it's not ours. Not entirely. What do we do about it? Um, and hence the Jebusites in Jerusalem, bang in the middle of Judah. You know, Judah is a, is a, is a significant, um, a significant uh, tribe. It's one of the largest, largest tribes in Israel. Bang in the middle of this, of this, Seemingly militarily quite capable tribe because they are you know, they're very prominent in uh, in the military congress. Is this town of Jebusite still there? And they've very wisely built themselves up in a in a place which is really hard to attack, so they can stay that way. And again, if you've been to or seen pictures or read films of places like Tuscany in Italy, there are lots of these hilltop towns still there. Um, you know, hilltop villages with walls around them. Uh, it's a, you know, whenever there's restless times, that's what people do. And so that's where they go. Um, they guess Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, and again, the inhabitant of the land is one of those terms that is used in his, it, to denote the pagan, uh, pagan peoples, nations that are in the promised land. So they're the inhabitants of the land who are to be expelled by Israel. I know this is a big jump, but what about... Um... The Germans. Uh, you do so big a jump that I, I, I landed in the middle of a puddle. What okay. about the Germans? Okay. Well, you know, kind of when we're reading this bit, you can almost see that uh, uh, where um, 
God's children. I know we're all God's children now, but you know that um, how, how that got about in our lifetime. Do you mean the destruction of peoples? Mm -hmm. Um, there is a law. Somebody, somebody came with this, and it's got you know, you've got like you've got Parkinson's law and this law and that law. There's some of this law which is that there so it takes any, I can't remember how many steps in any conversation before we start talking about the Nazis. <laughs> no, so really? we have just, we yeah. have just, we have just got Okay, there. sorry, but so we'll yes. time. Uh, <laughs> those two things have nothing to do with each other. Yes. Uh, but, for a couple yes. of reasons. One of them is that as we discover later on in this chapter, they're not all slain. They're not all slain. Slain. They're not all killed. Mm. Um, and because this was not, we are the master race and these are inferior people, oh, so we're just going to kill them because they're not really human. Uh, in fact, we're given a reason for why God wanted these nations removed and not just removed, but in some cases they have utterly destroyed man, woman, child, animals, was because God's patience with them had run out because of their, their abominable practices. Mm. And so he, he was part of God's punishment on them. Um, this, this isn't this particular attack on on Jerusalem is not in any sense genocidal because not all the inhabitants are killed anyway. It's not when that happens, uh, they don't just kill the people, but they they raise the base to the ground. The most famous example in the book of Joshua is the city of Ai, which is taken and they, they burn it to the ground. And it's, it's still there, it's still a mound. There's still a mound in Israel today under which lies the rubble of Ai, uh, mm. you know, three and a half thousand years later. Uh, so yeah, though it's it's not, you know, we could have, if we, if we were studying the book of Joshua, for example, we could have a whole discussion about genocide and, and the Old Testament. Um, I should add to this, that this is one of those questions that we only ask because we are Christians. And I don't mean just us in the room, but Westerners. That where the Western world is so heavily influenced by Christian thinking that the idea of indiscriminate killing of enemies is abhorrent to us. But it wasn't abhorrent, it was, it was just the normal thing to do in those days. It was the dumb thing. You know, if, if you know, there was always, if you got attacked by a greater power, you always have to make the calculation, do we fight or do we surrender? Mm -hmm. And how, you know, which is going to lead to fewer people dying? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, depending who the enemy was, so if you surrender to the wrong enemy, mm -hmm. you get slaughtered and enslaved because you surrendered. Whereas if you fought bravely and then lost, they said, well, well done, you're proper valiant people and, you know, and you've got respect. Or it could be the other way around. Just depends who the enemy is. But um, as, as as somebody I, I uh, know a little bit, and in fact his book is on, on the on the table there, and and, and uh, a gentleman called Glenn Scrivener, who's a is an Anglican uh, pastor and, a, and, a, and an evangelist um, in in England, and, and he he he's got really real gift for a good turn of phrase, it's good wordsmith, and he says that you know when people say this, you know. How you know the God of the Bible is a, is a, is a tyrant and is a, is a genocidal murderer? He says even the problems that atheists have with the Bible, they have because of the Bible, because yeah. the Bible alone teaches that these things are bad. Mm -hmm. They're not universal human truths, because if they were, they wouldn't be everywhere in history. So. Yeah, so that's that's the short answer. What actually happens with the Jebusites and some of the others as well, like uh, the um, Gideonites, for example, is that they ultimately become absorbed into Israel. So they are drawn from their heathen. Uh, you know, ultimately, it takes a long time. And this is why, you know, one reason why God wanted them gone was because he said, otherwise you will be tempted to follow their gods. And this is what happened for a thousand years. But ultimately, the God of Israel was triumphant. And now, whatever Jebusites were left, you know, they were very quickly they became assimilated into Israel instead. So, verse six still, uh, they said, the inhabitants of the land said to David, you will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off. 
i.e. you're so pathetic, you know, what David kind of come here, so they think he David kind of come here, so they're confident in their in their position. They're confident that they're in a secure place. Now, one of the things is if you if you if you built a town or a village even on top of a a rock, you've got one slight logistical problem if you're going to live there, which is how are you going to get water in there? Yeah. And the way, and we know this because they, they found them, we know how the ancients did it. They basically bored through the rock shafts that reached to the springs that were below. And there's even now, King Hezekiah, who was king during the time of Isaiah, we know that he dug a tunnel to lead water to the, bottom, to the bottom of one of these shafts. You can still walk through that tunnel today. It's still there, as it has done. This is pretty cool. If you go to Jerusalem, there's an amazing history there. Um, and you can say, you know, that thing where he says in, in you know, uh, 1 Kings chapter 20, you know, 2 Kings chapter 19, uh, that's it. You could do that with some things. Um, mm. But yeah, so they, this is, you know, but they, there was, you know, nobody will, nobody can get here because we've got walls. So they're going to have to climb up these steep banks and then to the, and that will take them to the, the walls. And if we shut the gates, we'll just, you know, the blind and the lame will wall them off and they just throw stones at them, whatever it is, and they, they can never get up here. They were confident because of what they had built. There's a kind of Tower of Babel experience in a sense. We've made it secure. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. That is the city of David. That's like the core part. That's the uh, Zion is one of the is like a, one of the hills next to Mount So there are several hills around this. It's a very hilly, hilly part of the world, and Zion is one of them. Um, and then we say David said on that day. So what, what we now get in verse eight is we now get the, how he did it. So we uh, we might, you know, somebody might write him today, if you want to be really clear, we'll just say to verse six, verse seven, and said, and this is how it happened. David said on that day, the writer just says, and David said on that day, but the and means this is how. So verse eight explains what happened in verse seven. Whoever David said, whoever would strike the Jebusites, let him get up the water shaft to attack the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. So, so yeah, the lame and the blind, yeah, the, the lame and the blind. Okay, let's go take on the lame and the blind. And it says basically let's scale up the water shaft. Now, not a very comfortable thing to do, but very thankfully they didn't have modern machinery in those days. To, to, so you couldn't just get a machine and do borehole, you know, four inches or six inches across. You had to physically hand hand hew your way in which meant that it was big enough to fit a man through because a man had gone down to shaft to build a shaft in the first place so to dig out the shaft in the first place and so they climbed up the water shaft scaled it up and bypassed the walls altogether and attacked from within and then we got this proverb therefore it is said the blind and the lame shall not come into the house the house meaning almost certainly at this point the, the king's palace mm -hmm. But this saying, because it's recorded in here, you know, there's, so there was a saying at that time in the uh, at the end of in the beginning of the 10th century BC, there was a saying because it was recorded, it survived as a saying, just like the you know it's, it's still among the prophets. It's still, you know, we still people still use that. But this partly explains the emphasis on. The healing of the blind and the lame in the Gospels. The blind and the lame are prominent, you know, we've got lots of healings of this and that, but the, the people who are actually singled out are frequently blind or lame. And already, you know, this, the healing of the blind and the lame was something that got picked up in you know, it's sort of introduced through the prophet Isaiah, that this is what will come when the kingdom of David is restored. Hmm. So this, you know, David kind of, David takes Jerusalem, that becomes the holy city, and it, and, and it brings this proverb, the blind and the lame shall not enter the house, into the house, but there will come a time of restoration when the blind will see and the deaf will hear and the lame will walk, meaning everybody has access to the king. Jesus is the king, and he brings it, brings it about, and we have access to him, so he, he, he becomes the healer of the nation. 
And we see this in that he opens the eyes of the blind and he makes the lame to walk. And, and that, that, that combination, when you read in the Gospels, so, you know, I don't know if you ever wondered about what, why is it that those two particularly get picked up? And this is one reason. So it's like a, it's like a sign in the Gospel saying, right, the greater David is here. It's like a little marker. David prohibited the entrance of the blind and the lame, but the greater David gets rid of this problem by getting rid of blindness and lameness. So this, it's a sort of very subtle, uh, a very subtle uh, connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, but one that Jesus' contemporaries would have been very much alive to. And then says David lived in a stronghold and called it the city of David, being a modest chap. <laughs> it's a bit like um, Alexander the Great, who went around conquering the world and establishing new cities. And every one of those called Alexandria. Mm -hmm. Now, only two of them survived, if I'm correct. One is in Egypt and it's called Alexandria. Here's a little mid, mid Bible study relief quiz question which is the other Alexandria that still survives? You either know or you don't know, I'm afraid. But if I, there's a very other. So, at one corner of Alexander's kingdom was Alexandria in Egypt in the southwest, and then in the Northeast of his kingdom is the city of Kandahar in Afghanistan. Oh, okay. So you've heard of Kandahar in the news. Mm -hmm. Kandahar is a corruption of the word Alexandria. Mm -hmm. So Kandahar was founded by Alexander the Great. So a bit like David, he liked to name cities after himself. So this was the city of David. It's a bit like there's a very famous fragment of, uh, of a second century writing um, which lists the books of the New Testament that the, the, the author uh, is, is, is writing an essay saying these are the books that we accept as being scripture. And it's very important because it demonstrates for us that already in the second century, basically, the New Testament looked like it looks to us now. And it was discovered by an Italian, Italian gentleman whose surname was Muratori. So you will never guess what he called it. He called it the Muratorian fragment. <laughs> um, same sort of thing. David found it, he called it the city of David. Um, and David became greater and greater for, or because, the Lord, of the, Lord the God of hosts, was with him. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, the Lord is Yahweh. So it, it, if I say it's, uh, uh, um, you say Yahweh, Elohim Tzavaot, God of hosts, God of hosts. God of Sabaoth. So the God of hosts here is the Sabaoth, is the Hebrew word which gives us Sabaoth, uh, which we have in the Sanctus. Um, I have mentioned this once or twice before, but just a quick word. And in fact, if you've read, if you've read your uh, British Lutheran um, in the last year or so, one of the, uh, there was an article about this. Uh, but God of hosts. Um, which the NIV translates as God Almighty, which is, is not a correct translation of the Hebrew word. It is the way that is rendered in the book of Revelation when we have the Sanctus Holy, Holy, Holy is repeated. And uh, it says, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord Almighty. But the Hebrew word is Tzavaot, which is translated traditionally as God of hosts. Now, what on earth is a host if you're a God of hosts? And I can assure you that has nothing to do with trolleys or drinks <laughs> or dinner parties. Bread was called the host. That too has got nothing to do with it either. Hmm. That comes from the Latin word hostia, uh, uh, which has the idea of the sacrifice, being that sacrifice. So what's it, if you're a God of hosts, what are we, what are we talking about? God of all the angels and all, all beings, really. Uh, you, getting warmer, yes, you're in the right ballpark. Mm. It really means God of armies or troops. God of armies. Oh, oh, yes. Hosts yes. being. Mm. Yes. Host being like, a, it was the King James Bible, I think, translated God, God of hosts. 
Yeah. And in those days, it made more sense. So if you've got hosts and hosts of people, well, you've got you've got armies and armies of people. Uh, so it's of the you know God of the troops, mm. if you like, might be a more idiomatic translation. And that's important. God is not very often called that in the histories. But thinking of what does it mean to say God is the God of the armies? David grew greater and greater because the Lord, Yahweh, the God of the armies, was with him. You know, God is, in a sense, Yahweh is a military God, in that he fights, he fights with the armies of Israel. If the Lord is on, on their side, no one can defeat them. If the Lord is not on their side, they have, they're on their own and they're small. Remember what Jesus said to Peter when Peter whisked out his uh, sword in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, you know, he could call on Ten legions of angels, if you wanted. Mm. Um, so these are the hosts, the armies of God. Um, that's what I'm not particularly fond of the phrase God of hosts, because it doesn't it doesn't communicate that in modern English at all, as far as I'm concerned. You know, every time I ask any any audience, if I ask this question, what's our host? I always get the same response, which is yours, which is you kind of throw things at things as a baby or something. Or other. People don't actually use that word in that sense anymore. Mm. And we, I think we're better, almost better off talking about God of God of Sabaoth, and everybody says, "I don't know what that means. What does that mean?" And you actually end up finding out. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so that's that's what it means. And 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 God being called that at this point when David is establishing his kingdom is significant because it means that God is God's troops are on his side okay so far so good then from verse uh 11 i'll read and hiram king of tyre sent messengers to david and cedar trees also carpenters and masons who built david a house and david knew that the lord had established him king over israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. And David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem after he came from Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to David. And these are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shamura, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibha, Elishua, Nepheg, Jephiah, Elishama, Eliada, and Eliphet. They all read that. <laughs> Yeah, these are the sons. <coughs> now, here we make one of our historical jumps because we were just in the year 1002. Hiram became king of Tyre in the year 980. So 22 years after the conquest of Jerusalem. So this is not the next thing that happened. But this is a kind of talking about the establishment, David's establishment and, and grow, growing success in Jerusalem. And so we, we are, you know, he's established his kingdom. Uh, he uh, built the city all around the Milo inward. So Milo is, Milo is the part that is between the original Jerusalem and Mount Moriah, which at this point was undeveloped. So that the slope, if you like, from the walls of Jerusalem to the top of the mountain, that's the Milo. And David goes from Milo inward, in other words, in the other direction, because it was, wasn't until the day, time of Solomon that the Milo was built and then the temple at the top. Um, and so we're talking about the development. And so while we're talking about David establishing Jerusalem, we now hear about how the David's palace came about. And it's with the help of Hiram, king of Tyre. Now, where is Tyre? Any idea? The two cities, there's Sidon and Tyre, which often get mentioned together. Mm. Um, it's modern day Lebanon. There were Phoenician cities. So uh, the Phoenicians were this, uh, sometimes known as the Sea Peoples. So they just know if you go up the coast from Israel northwards, you know, uh, once you go, uh, you very quickly and 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 in past you get past of Galilee, uh, you, you end up in what we now call Lebanon. And you got you have these two coastal city states, Tyre and Sidon, and the Sea Peoples who went all the way to Carthage, 
uh, the, the great enemies of early Rome or rivals to early Rome, uh, all over the Mediterranean, they basically went and they were tradespeople. Um, and they were very, very, very clever uh, naval uh, uh, people as well. And they established these coastal colonies all around the Mediterranean coast. Uh, the Philistines were, uh, we think, Phoenicians. So these are, mm. these are Phoenicians. The Philistines are further south within the kind of territory of Israel. A little bit further up the coast, you've got Tyre and Sidon. And they're still there, Tyre and Sidon. Um, if I'm, I'm going to get this right, around. Tyre was built, not Sidon. I think it's Tyre was built on an island just off the coast. Mm-hmm. So it was very, it was in, it defended all sides. It was fabulously wealthy because they, they were tradespeople. Mm-hmm. So they, they shipped, yeah. you know, they, 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 they traded in goods and they were a bit like Venice in the Middle Ages in Europe. Tiny place on an island, but they, they, they bought and sold the world's goods. Or something like that, you know, maybe something like Hong Kong or Macau later on yeah. in China. These are trading posts. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until Alexander the Great came along in the fourth century that he, he he managed to defeat Tyre by he just very patiently had uh, built a causeway to connect the island to the mainland and then he marched over it and defeated the city and that causeway is still there <laughs> so that that stayed they never put it up so but king so these are this but uh Lebanon is so so the Tyre uh, Sidonians and the people of Tyre are famous for their trading for the wealth Lebanon is famous for its Forests. So the cedars of cedar forests of cedars. Lebanon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the cedar forests of Lebanon uh, were kind of uh, proverbially famous. And these two things come together uh, <coughs> when uh, King of uh, Hiram, King of Tyre, sends these messengers to David with cedar trees, carpenters, and masons, and they built David a house. Now, it's very unlikely that Hiram say, you know what, I've got all these trees and people loitering and nothing to do. I know, well, I'm going to give my mate David a, a house for himself. This is clearly a dynastic arrangement. This is a sort, of, sort of an act of, it's like an like a act of friendship. Um, and now David, obviously, king, owes uh, the king of Tyre something. Now, this is 20 years into David's reign in Jerusalem, by which time he's been very successful. He's extended the kingdom far beyond its original borders and so one might say that this is a very shrewd way by Hiram to say David's going to be my friend mm. and that way he his back is secure David owes him one and that keeps Tyre secure from any any kind of hostile intentions and we see this later on because when Solomon builds the temple uh, this is you know, the uh, Hiram is still there and, and, and the wood for the temple comes from there. Um, and David knew, as he said, he, he realized, he understood that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of the people, his people Israel. This is such an important verse. You know, we, we, the, the story is interesting and then we get this little comment here, but this is what's really important. David realized, he understood, he knew that this was all the Lord's doing. Just in this morning's morning devotion online, it's Psalm 114, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name be glory. David, it wasn't David's strong arm that established his kingdom, it was the Lord. The Lord had established him king of Israel, not himself, and that he, the Lord, had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. When David forgot this, this is when things went wrong. It's a little bit like in modern politics. And I, I, one of the things I like to say, just as a sort of hopeless and uh, powerless comment, is that you know, I'm not very keen on democracy. I don't think it's a particularly good system of government because it's very inefficient and slow and you take votes and all sorts of things and often people vote for the wrong thing because they don't have all the facts, etc. What we really need is an enlightened dictatorship, somebody who's completely in charge of things and is good with it and has all the right ideas. And is, you know, is, is somebody who doesn't use the power for their own sake, but for the sake of everybody. That's the best form of government. It's got one pitfall, 
He doesn't exist. That is really hard to find dictators <laughs> who are enlightened or enlightened people who make good dictators or people who want to make them dictators remain enlightened. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That's the tricky, which is why Churchill is supposed to have said that democracy is the worst form of government, mm -hmm. except for all the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, and so we see with David as well, you know, the, the famous, I can't remember which Victorian Englishman said that, you know, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We see this even mm -hmm. with David, mm -hmm. that his power, he understood that this was the Lord's doing, but you can see how the power begins to co even corrupt him, even though he's the righteous king. Which is why it's such an astonishing thing when Jesus, you know, Jesus is king and he's humble. He's king of all things. You know, Learn from me for I'm meek, he says. You know, Jesus is meek and gentle and he's not corrupt, he's not self-seeking. But David's kingdom was established for the sake of his people Israel, not for his sake, not for his glory, not for anything else. But David's kingdom existed so that Israel might be led and blessed. And again, there's a very strong line we can draw from that to the ministry, you know, office of the ministry in the church. You know, that great, in you know, essentially great authority has been granted to, you know, to pastors in the church. But that authority and all of that. And the church, the whole of it, is, exists for the sake of God's people. And the moment it becomes something else, and that we call that corruption. Um, and so it's a sort of very important thing for us who are in the ordained ministry to remember that, that whatever has been given to the ministry has been given for the church, not uh, for personal gain or glory. But you're human. Yes, I am. Yeah. Yes, I am. But this is what, but this is not, we, we don't now talk about the state of my heart, but the administration of the actual public duties of it. And, and, and that's, the, that's the key point. You know, the public office exists for the pub, for public good and must be assessed in the public sphere. Um, you know, if, you know, you, you will not find a, a perfect or sinless or pure of heart person, but you don't need one. Yeah. If you needed one, I'm afraid we'd all be scuppered because you never find them. Mm -hmm. What you need is somebody who does what they've been called to do. Um, and that's, that's good enough. I come to think in the last few years that basically good enough is good enough. If it's good enough, it's good enough. And we don't need perfect people. Um, all we need is people who are faithful in their little patch. Who's faith, who, those who are faithful in a little will also be faithful in much. It's the kind of moral version of if you, you know, look after the pennies, the pounds will look after themselves. This is why it's so important that people in public office act with integrity in small things. Yeah. It's, a, you know, it's you're, You can tell an awful lot about a person when you look at how they treat people to whom they owe absolutely nothing, who are less powerful than themselves. And it doesn't make any, you, you don't become a better prime minister or better chief justice or a uh, better leader of the council or better anything, depending on how you treat the person who makes the tea for your meetings. But you can tell an awful lot about that person's character as to how they treat the person who makes the tea for their meetings. Because they, they will not lose any power if they treat them well or badly, but they do reveal their hearts. And it's very, very, very important. You know, if you're being, if you're thinking, you know, who should I vote for, or you know, which person should I trust? Think about how do they, how do they treat me? Who have nothing in their world. That's that's a, that's a good one. So, and we see this with David. His mileage with this varies, as we know. He doesn't always act with integrity, and when he doesn't act with integrity, all Israel suffers. Even when his, even when his sins are confined to a very specific, fairly narrow field, which you think, well, that's got nothing to do with anybody else. This is what I mean. For if I if I'm allowed a footnote at this point, um, you know, when we talk about things like uh, you know our current day debates about things like um, you know, the, sexu the sexuality and gender and those sort of things, you know, what difference does it make to me what people do with their bodies or who they shack up with or whatever, you know, what, you know, what do I lose 
if two men decide to get married or what do I lose if, if, if a woman somewhere decides that she wants to be there? What difference does it make to me? I mean, it doesn't change mine. My marriage doesn't collapse if somebody else gets married to somebody that I don't think they should get married to, right? If the, the answer is that if we do not uphold these things for their own sakes, if we don't hold up a common understanding of what it is to be human, or if we don't understand, hold up you know, what, what marriage actually is and what it's for, even though it doesn't have a direct influence on my particular marriage to my particular spouse, it undermines the institution of marriage, it undermines humanity itself, and therefore is detrimental to all. You know, if, if two people, what two, you know, say, what two people do in the privilege of the bedrooms is nobody else's business, they, perhaps not, but what our society says about it, what our laws say about it, impacts on everybody. Because, for example, if we begin to deny that humans are male or female, and you're one or the other, and you know, once you're one, you will always be one because that's what you are, then we are beginning to deny what humanity is, and that will have terrible detrimental effects down the line, as we can now see. You know, thousands and thousands of teenage girls designing their boys, and some of them are with the support and encouragement of their parents, teachers, and medical professionals doing irreversible damage to their bodies, rendering themselves infertile while they're still in their teens, you know, all kinds of kind of things, because we've forgotten what it is to be human. Mm. So what people do, what difference does it make? It makes all the difference. And so it's very, very important to hold on to all, the, you know, not just say, well, well, that's, you know, we need to worry about that. That's, that's nothing to do with this. Everything's got to do with everything in some ways, mm. because God is the creator of all things. And that's mm. why also our faithfulness in small things really, really matters because when we look up the small things and we do things just because God has given them for us to do, even though it's a well, world, what difference does it make if I do it? Um, you know, that time I, I mentioned before, you know, when, when I was little, my, <laughs> I went shopping with mum in a village grocery store and she was literally one penny short of her shopping. And she went back the next day to pay the extra penny and the lady at the till said, well, Come on, it's just ridiculous. And so, no, 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 I owed you a penny. Here's my penny. Mm. Yeah, right. And, and kind of holding on to those things once we have, we hold on to the integrity of things because we're not just looking at, well, you know, what, what difference is it in this moment? But the moment that we don't, well, once we let go of those things, we won't get them back. We will get them back. And it, the same is true also of our own character. The moment we let go, we make compromises with it and it. Okay, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I will cheat on my taxes here or whatever. We actually end up corrupting ourselves. We are, we change, and it's very difficult then to go back. You can't un go back on things once you let go of them. You jump off the ledge. It's very hard to climb back. As it were. And we see this verse thirteen. David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem. Presumably, these are the Jebusites. So he's now intermarrying with Jebusite women because he's taking them from Jerusalem. After he came from Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to David, as you'd expect. Um, in the law of Moses, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 17, it says this. Well, I'll go back a couple of verses to verse 14. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and they, then they say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. That's 1 Samuel, right? You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. Do you remember what David did when he conquered the Philistines cavalry. He hamstrung their horses, he didn't keep them. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Now, if you think of Solomon, he ticked every one of those boxes eventually, and it all went horribly wrong for Solomon. David didn't tick all of them, he does tick one. You shall not take many wives, and he did, and he took them from the Jebusites. So we see that the, even though David acknowledges God, 
is beginning to be corrupted to some degree by the power that God has given. And then here are the names of those who were born in Jerusalem, and you've got the list here from Shamua to Eliphalet, and you'll see there that uh, you've got Shamua, Shoba, Nathan, Solomon. Thank you. So we are now counting there also the children of Bathsheba, who we haven't met yet. So that's David uh, established in Jerusalem now. And apart from the building of the house, this is beginning the year 2002 uh, onwards, and then we, we, we skip to the future for the building of David's palace. More war. Are you ready for more war? Should we, can we finish the uh, rest of the chapter? Carol, would you be happy to read the rest? I will. Thank you. To the, oh, yes, right. Yeah. I'm not just have to check where I am. Wait, there was one verse that was there. Um, right. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up in search of David. But David heard of it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up against the Philistines? Wilt thou give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And David came to Baalzeperim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a bursting flood. Therefore the name of that place is called Baalperism. And the Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, you shall not go up, go around to their rear and come upon them opposite the balsam trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then bestir yourself. For then the Lord has gone out before you to smite the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him and smote the Philistines from Giza to Giza. Thank you very much. Good. I meant to say just before we come to this part, you just read. I was going to just ask, do you remember what's the difference in verse thirteen? Um, what's the difference between a concubine and a wife? Slave and not necessarily. A wife marry. Concubine, concubine might be slave, but not, not necessarily. Uh, concubine was really one stage down from a wife. Mm -hmm. Yes, so they're they're yes. With a, a wife of a lower status, the usual yeah. distinction I'm told is that for a, a you, for a wife you would pay a bride price. Oh yes, and the concubine. For a concubine you did you not, and that because you took a concubine without paying the bride price, that means that they essentially they were not in a, their family was not in a bargaining position, no. and they were um, for whatever reason, um, and so it was it was all to do with power. And therefore status so you had two essentially two degrees of spouse wife and the mm. concubine concubine had less has had lower status for your rights the children of the concubine would not normally inherit mm. yeah. who was solomon's mother Bathsheba. Bathsheba. yeah one of the wives as we will discover yeah yes anyway so now we the philistines now remember when philistines said that david had been the Lord king of israel all the philistines went up to search for david now last time we heard the philistines what was the relation between David and the Philistines last time we came across the Philistines? He was story. amongst them. He was amongst them. He, they, he had allied themself, himself mm. with them. And remember, they gave him Ziklag as a, a, a city of, a, within Philistia, was mm. given for him and his men. And now, what we have all of a sudden, you know, um, David is now king of Israel. Israel is the enemy, so he's no longer their friend. And they go in search of him. That is to say, they go pursue him. As David heard of it, went down to the stronghold. What stronghold? Jerusalem? Possibly. Oh. So there are a couple of theories. Yeah. One, one possibility is that this is actually before the conquest of Jerusalem. Oh. And that this, this takes place uh, just before, and that the, we're still talking about whatever stronghold he had somewhere near Hebron. I wondered if it was. Yeah, because I think Hebron is, if I remember correctly, Hebron is on higher ground than Jerusalem, so it's still, mm. uh, again on a height. 
Uh, the, another possibility is that he went down from Hebron to Jerusalem, the stronghold. And we can't really know which it is. Doesn't matter very much, but yeah, just sort of, I, I, he's built his city and it's got a wall around it. No, the, he, he already had a wall. The Jebusites already oh, built right. it. He's just extended it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So when he's built his city, all he's done is extended it. Uh, the listeners have come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. We're not 100% sure where Rephaim is, but it's probably north west of Jerusalem. So from Jerusalem, so up a bit and towards Philistia, towards the sea. Um, and now we have David again doing, remember, we're constantly, we're supposed to remember what Saul did and what, what David does. So Philistines come up and David is essentially saying, right, shall we go and get them? Rather than, shall we avoid battle? And, but he, he does ask that question. He doesn't just make up his mind. He inquires of the Lord. When they inquire of the Lord, uh, do you remember what that means in this context? He goes to the temple and inquires of the. What does that mean to inquire? You, we have we've now got to the point where we are inquire. What does the inquire of the Lord mean? Find out what the Lord wants. Yeah, but what what does he do? What does he actually do? Pray, pray. Um, it's actually more specific than that. He he goes to the high priest. He oh, has the urim oh, and the thummim. Yeah. Mm. And, and and he consults the high priest. So it's not a prayer wait for God to whisper in his ear. Mm. Um, he goes to, you know, he goes to, there isn't the temple, there's the there's the Ark of the Covenant, there's the sanctuary, mm. the, the tabernacle, and there's a high priest. <coughs> and he asks, and again, notice how it's yes, no answers on the whole. Mm -hmm. Drawing box. Shall I go up against the answer? Yes, no. The answer is yes. Will you give them into my hand? Yes. And we had given this Lord said to David, go off, I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand, which is a, a, a nice way of saying basically he drew the yes lot both times. Uh, and drawing lots, remember, this is not just some game of luck, uh, a chance, you know, drawing you know, a short straw, uh, but this is a God given way to inquire of him. And one of the things it does, and remember the you know, when the, when the apostles gather before ascension, uh, before Pentecost, after the ascension of Christ, to fulfill the number of 12 apostles because Judas is dead, they draw lots mm. to find that. They, they draw a short list of eligible candidates mm. and then they draw lots between them. And I have said this, and people always think I'm joking, and I'm not joking. I think this would be a fantastic way for the church also to choose pastors and heads, you know, leaders of the church, bishops or whatever, rather than having a, a democratic vote and say who gets, you draw up a list of who's, who's, available, who, who's eligible, yeah. and then you draw lots. Yeah. Pray, ask the Holy Spirit, like the apostles did, to indicate what his will is, and then draw lots, and then take that everywhere and say, okay, we take that as given from God. Yeah. Yeah. And that I would, I think that would get rid of an awful lot of rubbish yeah. in politics in the church. Mm -hmm. Because you would not end up in a situation where you say, well, I didn't vote for him. I, I told you that he was a, he was a bad mm -hmm. um, And you never get campaigning either, because a lot of churches, you, you, you do, you get, you know, it doesn't happen in the LC, but in, uh, you, you get, like in, in, back in Finland, the Lutheran church, there's an election for a bishop, and they they literally campaign. They're based on the size of buses. Mm. And uh, there's an old saying that a desire to hold the Episcopal office disqualifies you from, from that office. Yeah. And if, you, if you're so eager, you're probably not the right person. Mm. Anyway, that's by the by. So maybe one day I, I'll drive through a, a, a constitutional change in our church, and so we will draw lots for every office. Uh, and David came to so he got there and came to Baal Perazim, and David defeated them there. And he said, The Lord has broken through my enemies for me like a breaking flood. Not unto us, but unto thy name be God. Here we go again. So David wins and doesn't say, I won. No women come singing, saw through the thousands, David sent the thousands. David speaks first and says, The Lord has done this for us. Therefore, that name of that place is called Baal Perazim. The word Baal means Lord, as in kind of overlord. 
Baal Perazim is the Lord of bursting through. <laughs> it's very, very physical, a very, very literal description. One very good, I think one very good barometer of the spiritual, the spiritual health of a person or a church or a family is to see how much thanksgiving to God there is. Um, I think I've told you this before. I remember some years ago, my parents went to a, some sort of a family, re, uh, family anniversary event. I can't remember what it was. And it was it certainly, certainly like quite a nice, nice do. And uh, I spoke with my parents after they got back. And uh, I remember my father saying, so, well, it was all right, you know, nice food and nice people, but nobody gave thanks to God. You know, there's no thanksgiving for you know we celebrate all the blessings that have come on this family but nobody gave thanks to god for it and this mm -hmm. thanksgiving to god you know it's you know um, if, if you ask ourselves are we truly thankful to god as we ought to be the answer is always going to be no but to recognize God, because it's, uh, recognize God's presence in our lives and his work in our lives is such an important uh, dimension of faith. It's not that God said, you know, well, say thank you or else. You know, I'm not going to give you another sweet answer to say thank you for the first one. But the point is that when we give thanks to God, we acknowledge what he has done. And therefore, we're drawn by faith to, to, to see his work in our lives. That's why it's so important. I think, yeah, and you know, very wise, but the Christian tradition that is not Christian, it goes right through biblical times that you begin the day by giving thanks to God that you've got a new day. And then you go to bed at the end of the day thanking God that you have had this day. Mm. Because in a way, when you wake up in the morning, well, nobody gave you any guarantee that you would. And there, every day there are people who don't wake up in the morning. And when you go to bed at night, and you survive the day, well, that day, many people won't have survived the day, but you did, the gift. And think of all then, if you list all the things, what, has, what did God give me this night? What did God give me this day? Which is why we give thanks before we, before, you know, when we eat, we thank you, thanks to God for, you know, we give us the daily bread, he did. And the more that we do that, the more our hearts are drawn to God. And we, he, he teaches us, we teach ourselves by giving thanks to recognize what God has done for us. In the same way, I mean, um, somebody, the husband once, he said, you know, you know, the wife did most of the cooking, but every now and then the husband would cook. And then he, he, one day he said, you know, he said, there's something, there's something I really miss when I've done the cooking. So I don't get to say thank you. Mm -hmm. I can't say, I can't say, I can't get to say thank you for this meal because I cooked it myself. And he came across as a deprivation because he's so accustomed. She cooks for me, I thank, thank her for it. And when I cook, I'm, I'm deprived of the opportunity to say thank you. And it kind of felt like a, like a loss. Um, but, you know, that kind of attitude that's like, you know, what has God done for us? Well, you know, where do we start? Start making a list and you, you'll do nothing else all day when you start listing all that God has given to us. Like, in the, you know, when the, in the catechism, in the um, explanation of the Lord's Prayer, uh, of the fourth petition, give us this day our daily bread. And and the question is in here, so what is this? And well, we say God could give daily bread, even without our prayer to all evil people, evil people. We pray in this petition that God will lead us to recognize this and to receive our daily bread with thanksgiving. What is meant by daily bread? And the list is daily bread includes everything that has to do with the support and needs of the body, such as. Food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods, devout husband and wife, devout children, devout workers, devout and faithful rulers, good government, good weather, peace, health, self-control, good reputation, good friends, faithful neighbours, and the like, i.e. you could uh, carry on like that. Mm. And even when it's raining and blowing a gale, we've still got lots of the other things still left on the list. And even if we think that the government's not necessarily doing the best possible job, yeah, but there's been a harvest again. You know, there's food on the shelves. Anyway. Um, and when we give thanks, we, that's, that's God's, you know, God's, you know, give thanks to the Lord for he's good, says the psalm. And when we do, it draws us to behold the goodness of God. And that 
and that's how our faith grows and our draw our love for God grows that way as well. So the, you know it's, it's a wonderful example. Of it. David has a great military success and said the Lord has done it. We're not as good at it as we ought to be at all, individually, but also I think as a church, maybe we're not. I, I, it is my experience that the, the Lutheran church is not the most prayerful church around. Not the most? Prayerful church oh. around. And something that we ought to repent of and, and, and mm. grow better at. For our own sakes and for the sake of the world. Well, I've had calls recently to say thank you very much for the people that have been surrounding me to help do things I didn't particularly want doing to me. Yeah. <laughs> kind and understanding people and mm. they just had them in place yes. for me. Not that I trusted to start with, I'm sorry to say, but um, I did say thank you. Yes. Mm. And, and it is, I mean, when you start looking at, you know, there are so many different ways in which God blesses mm. us all the time. Mm. Things we take for granted. You know, I, I turn the light on just so that we've got enough, enough light here for your reading and for the camera or whatever. And I turn it on and the light came on. Mm. I lived in a country where that wasn't guaranteed. You turn mm. the light on, it might not come on. <laughs> you know, I, I've used the tap several times today and the water there is clean. <laughs> and I didn't need to wonder about, will there be water and will it be clean? Do I need to boil it first or do I just drink it? Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. And these are just things that, you know, we can live without. Mm -hmm. And there are things that we can't live without. And that's before we get to all the spiritual bit. That's before we come to the forgiveness of sins and eternal life that Jesus wrote. It's, it's, you, know, you start meditating on it and it's, it becomes overwhelming very quickly. Mm -hmm. Give thanks to the Lord for his good. Instead, pass nothing to a spread. You have to sort of, you have to um get on your knees to do that or is it you know sort of in your mind when you're jumping in the bus that you need to be on but you still can be thanking god why choose you can have both depending well, on the circumstances well i was going to say you know, know if you're on the bus. here doing what you're doing but you know there might be sort of people oh, i'm gonna miss that bus i'm needing to get on it yeah. so you know it's, it's a circumstance there is no we don't have to do anything we have to, we all, we all to give thanks because we don't give thanks that shows that we don't trust God and that we've got a big problem there. But uh, you don't, there's no rule about how you do it. But there are, there are things that are wise. And so, for example, you know, I say to you, each of you lives alone. And I would say, even if you live alone, I would recommend that you pray aloud rather than in your head. For a couple of reasons. One of them is much easier to keep your thoughts together because you're having to think mm -hmm. about what you say rather than your mind wandering. But also, mm -hmm. those words coming back to your ears is important, an important part of prayer. It's not just that you speak to God in your head, but actually you're hearing the words, and those words, your own words, feed you. Um, bodily, how what what posture uh, um, we adopt when praying. Again, there's nothing in the Bible that you must do like this, but there are things that are more helpful than others. So there's a reason why Christians have traditionally stood or kneeled for prayer, because it, first of all, is changed from the usual. We, we change posture when talking to God in the way that, you know, we used to, I don't think my kids have to do that anymore, but when, when I was still at school, if the head teacher came to school, we stood up. Yeah. We were dressed by an you know, and he spoke and until you were sat down, mm -hmm. and then you sat down, you go to the courtroom, you know, all rise. Mm -hmm. You speak to the judge, you stand. And again, mm -hmm. it's, it's to recognize the presence of the other. It's recognized the honor or the, or the majesty or the power or whatever it mm. is of who it is. So when we change posture for God rather than just kind of slouching on the sofa, uh, just like we would be talking to a you know, passing cat, um, we are recognizing that you know, we are telling ourselves, we are reminding ourselves that what it is that we engaged in. Mm. And of course, a po you know, prayer is posture of standing is a kind of showing of honor, posture of kneeling is a posture of humility. These things, they, they help us. Make, if you get on your knees, now you can think of how oh, my knees are hurting. How will I ever get up? That might not be the best thing for you personally. Um, but, you know, these things, they're not laws. So you're sinning or default if you do that. But they're things that help us. Um, and, and generally speaking, I say that the rule of thumb is that what works for most people works for most people. Most of us aren't really exceptional. You know, 99% of Christians have found praying on their knees or praying something up helpful, but I'm different. 
not likely. It's very unlikely you're that different. I mean, there might be one or two, but um, it, yeah, that would be my answer to that. But obviously, if you're in traffic and you're driving along the motorway and you just avoid beating a bus coming mm -hmm. sideways at you, you don't have to mm -hmm. get on your knees in the car to say thank you. Of course, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Thank you. Not on your knees. Yeah, of course not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and circumstances vary. Mm -hmm. Like when I do the morning devotions on, on, online. Um, you know, I often say that if you are able, I recommend you know, join in. Don't just listen. Listen to me go rattling through matters. Join in all the bits. Say the psalms with me. Sing them with me. Do the responses if you can. But if you're sitting, you know, if you're sitting in a crowded cafe, mm. or in the or in the reading room or library, that might not be the best idea. No. But if you're at home, why not? So these 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 you know, there there is no law uh, about it. Verse 21, the Philistines left their idols there. So they've taken their gods to battle with them. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they left in such a hurry that they had their gods behind it was a double defeat. Remember what happened when the Israelites went to the battle with the Ark of the Covenant, Eli's sons leaving them. At the very beginning of our story, in, at the beginning of 1 Samuel. Got taken from them, didn't they? Got it? taken from yeah. them. And it was an utter disaster. And Eli yeah. was killed out of shock. And his mm -hmm. wife went to labor out of shock. He was all... Finally, it's the other way around. We are in mm. chapter five of the second book, and now the Philistines has come and they leave their gods behind, mm. and, they've, and the Israelites are the, uh, carry them off. What um, was done with them, we are not told. I truly hope that they got <laughs> burnt or Smashed. smashed to bit of smithereens. But this is now the reverse. We see that at last the tables have turned. After all this, you know, we could, we, we're 40, uh, 40 years into the story. Mm. And now, now, sorry, no, we're more than 40 into the story because we're talking about the time when Samuel was a little boy. So we'd, you know, this is a, you know, coming up to a century after the initial thing, mm. or more than half a century, certainly. And finally, the Philistines now leave their gods behind the Israelites taken no away. And notice that nothing bad happens to the Israelites. Whereas the Philistines got their tumors and things like that, because these are idols, not true gods. The word idol here means the statues. Yeah, the, the graven images. And so the Philistines came up yet again and you know, take two, second time round. And David inquired of the Lord again. He didn't say, oh, we went really well. I know what to do. Uh, but he asked the Lord again. Now, again, very important. If the Lord's on your side. You remember when, when Israel sent, in the book of Numbers, the Israelites sent 12 spies into the promised land. And they came back. And 10 of the spies said, do you remember? What did they say? Well, just they were mm -hmm. outnumbered. But yeah, they're, they're giants out yes. there. And their forces is, we, we know, we, they, we got no hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the people of Israel panicked. And so the Lord said, okay, fine, you're not going in there. You don't want to go in, you're not going in. You're all going to die in the wilderness. Mm. And they said, oh, so, 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 I'm so sorry. We will go. Mm. And Moses said, don't go. The Lord is not going with you. He said, you're not going to go. And they go, and they're defeated. Because the Lord wasn't with them. Mm. Um, and and this, is, this is exactly the same here. David has won a battle, but he doesn't want to go unless the Lord is on his side, and so he inquires again. And the answer is, don't go. Don't go to battle with them. Go around to their rear and come against them opposite the balsam trees. Now, here we're not told. this. You wouldn't get this detail from just drawing lots. So how this detail, we're simply not told how this detail comes about, but it's a direct, some sort of prophetic, uh, prophetic information that's given to David presumably through the priest. And so when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the balsam trees, then rouse yourself, for then the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of Philistine. I.e., you can hear marching overhead. Because this is the Lord who's the God of. What is the what is the Lord the God of? Sorry? What is the Lord the God of? 
who just comes to earlier today and this afternoon. The armies. God of the armies. So the, God, the Lord will kind of march ahead into battle and you just join him in battle. Mm -hmm. You can hear the marching in the tops of the trees. And then you go, the Lord has gone out before you to strike down the army of the Philistines. And David did as the Lord commanded him and struck down the Philistines from Geba to Giza. Or Gibeon to Giza. So basically, this is the breaking of the back of the Philistines. Mm -hmm. And it's right at the beginning of David's reign over all Israel. And again, we have a massive contrast between mm -hmm. Saul and David. You know, Saul would repel the Philistines, but they were always there. And when Saul dies, the Philistines occupy, occupy Israelite cities. They kind of uh, come as an occupied force. David is here, and because he goes with the Lord, the Lord's favor is with him, and he breaks the back of the resistance. They lose their idols, and they lose their battles. Mm -hmm. And th thus is uh, David's kingdom uh, established. Next, we will come to chapter six, which again, we will jump forward uh, in time uh, to a later time, but it's the next significant act, which is the bringing of the ark into Jerusalem. And if you want to have a little sneak preview of it, there are two things there that will cause, I can tell you now that you will want to discuss. One is the fate of Uzzah, who touches the ark and dies. And the other one is David dancing before the Lord. That always comes up when, when there's passages people also want to talk about that, so I expect you will as well. Uh, so if you want to have a preview, you know, read, read ahead of it uh, before next week. Any closing thoughts? It's exactly three o'clock, so that's worth out for well. Anything, yeah. anything left to ask or comment or? You did see scrolls and uh, come. Does that mean they put that in because they found out what the what, Dipsy, sorry, what was departing? It's got uh, deep sea scrolls, verses four, five to three, on the bottom of the Bible there. On one of the, does that put, is that being put in when they found? Deep sea scrolls. Dead sea scrolls. Dead sea scrolls. Yeah. No, no, the, yeah. So, yeah, see, yeah, yeah that's the information. Not all manuscripts have all the same things. Oh, right. Yeah. So, it wasn't put in extra when they found it. Mm. When they found out about it. This translation was made 60 years, 50 years after the scrolls were found. Oh, right. So, this translation was done in about 2001. Oh, right. And the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947. Oh, right. Yes. So, that's so they take into account. Okay. Yeah. But that's for um yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean I'm not sure why they thought it's there, it doesn't really matter. Oh. Yeah. Let's close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the goodness, all the loving kindness and the mercies that with which you fill our lives individually and jointly we thank you for this day and for this uh this uh, this time we've had to study your word together and we pray that your word would continually work in our hearts to produce faith hope and love faith in your promises hope uh in the kingdom to come and love for you and for our neighbors whenever we fall and fail when we become corrupted by the sin within or the world without it. Pray that you'd restore us through the forgiveness of sins and through the fruits of the Holy Spirit to live before you with a good conscience. Bless the whole church and this whole dying world through the proclamation of the gospel. As may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.